Okay, um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are joining us. My time is exactly two minutes past the hour, and we are ready to begin our webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar. Uh, this is a webinar that falls under the Climate, Land, Agriculture and Biodiversity Africa project, which is a project that is being led by the University of Pretoria Future Africa Institute in collaboration with the United Nations Environment Program, UNAP, in partnership with the Food, Agriculture and Natural Resources Policy Analysis Network, FANAPAN. Today, we are co-convening this webinar in collaboration with the Center for Coordination of Agricultural Research and Development for Southern Africa, CADESA. And we thank you for joining us. We are going to be together for the next hour and a half, and hopefully we are going to get to the bottom of what are some of the climate impacts on food systems, how that is affecting people, animal ecosystem health and well-being. And we are also going to be looking at land restoration and biodiversity issues, as well as land, water, energy resources uses. So without much further ado, I would like to welcome our co-conveners for the uh, for the webinar to give us our welcoming and opening remarks. We'll start off with Dr. Neeraj Mistry, who is the Deputy Director for Future Africa at the University of Pretoria. Dr. Mistry, over to you. You are on mute, Dr. Mistry. My apologies, you're on mute. Thank you. You there can unmute. There you um, thank you so much, Tembi, and uh, welcome everyone. Good day to everyone uh, who's joined this webinar. It's a really, really important webinar. On behalf of Future Africa at the University of Pretoria, I'm delighted to welcome all of you, and especially to be collaborating with our partners from CARDISA and UNEP and FANRUPAN. Uh, together with support that we've received from the French Embassy and the Agency for Development in France, as well as in the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and UNEP. Uh, this is a, a really important partnership. And as many of you know, Future Africa is one of the transdisciplinary platforms at the University of Pretoria. Uh, we have a campus where we look very much uh, to inviting all of you and uh, uh, engaging in person. Uh, we we quite excited that the South African government just yesterday has lifted all COVID restrictions on travel, on mask wearing, on gatherings, etc. So we're keeping our fingers crossed for um, uh, really fruitful gatherings uh, and, and reconnecting in society, especially on topical issues like this. Future Africa also has an institute where we're dealing with transdisciplinary uh, challenges. Um, these complex challenges in the world and climate, land, agriculture, and biodiversity typifies the type of issue we want to deal with through a transdisciplinary lens. And we're very fortunate to have Prof. Lindy Sibanda, uh, who leads this effort with support from Tembi and with uh, Sheila Chikolu. Um, so without much uh, further ado, I want to also acknowledge partners such as uh, CISANET, uh, ORDA, NEPAD, uh, SIMIAT, and uh, COMISA, Trust Africa, and Menandi Africa, uh, from which we have uh, speakers from all these various institutions to contribute to this panel. So looking for, forward to really good discussion and welcome once again. Over to our partners. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maestri, for that welcome uh, remarks. We will now hand over to uh, Dr. Oscar Ivanova, who is the Global Adaptation Network uh, Regional Liaison for Africa at the United Yes, and welcome, everyone. It is uh, my great pleasure and my great honor to be part of today's very important webinar and to be able to speak on behalf of the UN Environment Programme and of the Global Adaptation Network. UNEP's mission is to provide leadership and encourage partnership in caring for the environment by inspiring, informing and enabling nations and peoples to improve their quality of life without compromising that of future generations. 
UNEP works on delivering transformational change for people and nature by drilling down on the root causes of the three planetary crises of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss, and pollution and waste. It is currently estimated that six out of 10 of the most threatened countries by climate change are in Africa. And that under the current scenarios, Africa will experience a temperature increase of 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees by 2025 and 2043, respectively. The Collab Initiative is therefore a very timely and important effort as it seeks to provide a platform for the African scientific community to work together to, on addressing the policy implementation gaps on climate change, land, agriculture, and biodiversity notably by providing policy ready information and tested innovations that can be translated and delivered to support African decision makers and private sector stakeholders to design and inform sound policy strategies and initiatives to increase the use of science on sustainability issues. And it is even more crucial to identify and elevate Africa's specific knowledge in the development of responses that may support the arguments of African states and development institutions in various negotiations and policy framework discussions, such as the COP27 that will be happening later this year. We hope that together we will be able to give more importance to the voice of African researchers and find solutions that can inspire policymakers, the private sector and other stakeholders to address sustainability issues in Africa. And for all these reasons, we are very happy to be able to support this great initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ivanova, for those uh, welcoming remarks. We will now hand over to uh, Dr. Baitsi Podisi, who is the CADEP XP4 Regional Program Coordinator at the Center for Coordination of Agricultural Research and Development for Southern Africa to give us his opening remarks. Well, thank you, Sitembile. Uh, thank you for, on behalf of the CADESA Executive Director, uh, Dr. Cliff Glamini, uh, uh, for this initiative of working together. We at CADESA prize the partnership that we have with FANAPAN over the years where we've consistently under undertaken uh, key activities for the region together. We do appreciate that. And uh, of course, we appreciate the partnership of CADESA with a number of stakeholders who are represented here, uh, members of the CG centers who are here, uh, the NEPAD coordinating agency of the African Union that are here in the room. I also want to acknowledge the prominent role that is being played by Future Africa on these important uh, regional issues. Uh, we are noting that because we do want to encourage these centers of excellence to be recognized and their work to be taken up by our stakeholders to inform uh, policy making in the region. Uh, CADESA is a SADC subsidiary which was created by SADC member states to coordinate and facilitate cooperation among SADC member states on issues to do with agricultural research and development. And we work in all the 16 member countries as a secretariat and we work through various partnerships with key stakeholders who have got certain uh, strengths uh, in the region uh, to drive issues which are of importance covering the four key commodities that is livestock uh, fisheries forestry and and crops in the region of course issues across the whole value chain and uh, we have for ourselves uh, a mission which includes, to, of course, to set the, the, the research agenda for the region. Uh, we, our mission is to set the research and development agenda and mobilize resources, support capacity, development, foster collaboration, and provide agricultural information and knowledge in the region where we envision to have a sustainable agricultural growth and socioeconomic development in the SADC. Therefore, I think the, this webinar and the CAP I mean, initiative really resonates with the work that Adesa does, and we are happy to be part of this discourse uh, later on, of course, 
will indicate how CADESA uh, uh, fits in with the themes that are being articulated under the PLEB program. I want to particularly highlight the importance of key drivers, particularly the issue of uh, climate change in the region, which is impacting on all the factors that we are going to discuss. And CADESA is playing a very in, uh, dominant role in terms of convening and rallying all the forces within the region to address this important uh, phenomenon in our region, which is, uh, of course, affecting uh, the agricultural sector, among others. Uh, we are just happy that uh, we've been given this opportunity to, uh, of course, interact with a number of stakeholders here. We will, of course, highlight later on how we intend to continue engaging with all of you as we rally the troops to address these important uh, regional priorities in a region that is facing a lot of uh, a number of opportunities as well as challenges. As you know, we have a, a rapidly go growing uh, uh, regional population, which is and our production of food is not really matching the increasing demand as well as the different products that are being demanded by our population in the region as the incomes have improved over time and of course there are other disruptors that we are noting uh, including the the recent global activities including uh, wars which are affecting the availability of food commodities in our region and uh, we, these are some of the things that we have to work on and also address because they directly impact on the livelihoods of our people. And uh, we are happy really to be part of this. We hope to, to share some good thoughts as the, as the webinar continues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bodisi, for um, your welcoming remarks and highlighting the challenges that the region faces and just rallying everyone to work together to make sure that we address those challenges. At this point, before we go into the Club Africa presentation, I would like to invite everyone who is on the call today to turn on their cameras for a group photo. We need to memorialize uh, this webinar and we would like to just capture the beautiful smiles of all the people from across Southern Africa. So if we can have our cameras just turned on briefly for a quick group photo before we transition to the presentation. Okay, Tembi, thank you so much. Uh, so may I also request that we all put a nice smile. Whilst we... Sylvester, you can give us the cue of when to smile. <laughs> Sylvester has blocked my camera so I can't turn it on. Okay, so we have the first snap. Okay, I take the second. Thank you very much, Tembi. Tembi, you may proceed. Tembi, you may proceed. You're muted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My apologies. At this point, we are now going to transition into the presentation of the day that's going to frame the discussions that will follow. I would like to invite Ms. Tendai Saidi from the Civil Society Agriculture Network in Malawi to deliver the presentation. Over to you, Tendai. Thank you, Tembi. <clears throat> So allow me not to uh, share, open the video uh, for reasons for network. So I will be, I hope you saw me when we we're taking the picture and I will be making this presentation. So my name is Tendai Saidi, all protocols observed and good morning to everyone. Um, I'll be making the presentation on the climate, land, agriculture, biodiversity, uh, the club project. Uh, I'm a nutritionist by profession and I 
currently working as the head of programs and policy at the Civil Society Agriculture Network, which is a network of CSOs in, in the agriculture sector working to influence policies. And we are also the Nord Host Institute for Fanapan. So this is quite exciting to be taking part in the webinar, which is one in a series of five. My presentation outline uh, will highlight some of the key outcomes from the Club Africa project. I will first give an overview of the nature of Africa's environmental challenges before unpacking what the Club Africa project is all about. Then after that, I will also present on the key outcomes according to the four clusters, and thereafter, I will also conclude. So climate change is bringing repeated extreme events, such as droughts and heat waves, which adversely affect, among other things, the ability of poor people to cope with crop failure and maintain food security as their savings. It also results in diminished human capital. And Africa has the most severe vulnerable hotspots to climate change, hence increasing the food and water deficit. So all these interactions among climate change drivers are very complex. And owing to this complexity, a holistic framework assessing the various environmental risks is required. Evidence of these interactions is needed, including the role of the adaptation and development res responses. So assessing environmental dynamics that bring together agriculture, biodiversity, land and water becomes a complex effort, particularly when we are looking at these elements and how they arise with various sectorial, temporal, spatial and response option frontiers. So accordingly, the interaction of all these factors may amplify or diminish impacts addressing these challenges, requiring new technologies that deal with multiple and interacting stresses. Hence, here in Africa, climate change impacts such as the recent cyclones, which we also affect, experienced here in Malawi, for instance, in the southern region, can be more severe, not only because of the extreme events, but also because of the interactions with local government and institution systems implementing climate change responses. So about the Club African project, um, when we look at all these relationships that I have already mentioned, the land, the water, the energy management, they provide the foundations for sustainable development and human cap capital. So the club project was conceived by Future Africa and is generously being supported by the French embassy, the French agency for development, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the UN environment program. And Fanapan being the, a unique and all inclusive convening platform for policy dialogues it's now bringing in different stakeholders as they come in to support the policy engagements and dialogues convening components of the project. So the club project was also envisaged to provide a platform for Africa's scientific community to contribute to the development work of African governments and development institution. And specifically, it desires to aid the work of African governments and institutions by providing science-based actionable policy recommendations drawn from innovation solutions on the African continent within the four identified project clusters. So these four clusters, are, as you can see from the slide, the climate impact on food systems and whose objective is pursuing recommendations on how applying climate change science can improve food systems, renewable energy can be a solution for climate sensitive food solutions and Africa's plant diversity can be used for increasing the yield and improving nutrition. The second cluster is people, animal, ecosystems, health, and well-being. Under this cluster, uh, the objective is to is pursuing recommendations for improving human health through interventions in ecosystems and animal health. The third one is land restoration and biodiversity whose objective is to pursue recommendations for land restorations for improved biodiversity in farming, landscapes and achieving neutrality for land degradation. And the last cluster is that on land water energy resources. And this one, uh, we are looking at uh, 
pursuing recommendations for suitable resource use optimization. So when we look at the cluster outcomes, uh, the impacts of climate change on food system is um, poses a substantial threat to efforts made to reduce poverty. Africa's government governance frameworks at a regional and sub-regional level are generally sound in regarding the necessary expressed or implied provisions for addressing climate change and its impacts. Transforming Africa's food systems will entail building the capacity of food system actors, such as individual farmers, households, and communities to be able to adapt, respond to, and recover from environmental, economic, and social shocks, which can affect livelihoods. Some of the key policy recommendations, therefore, include uh, building on enhancing robust financial investments in climate smart agriculture, documenting and integrating indigenous knowledge, promoting of agriculture practices that support sustainable food systems, implementing adaptation solutions and minimizing food waste. So these are some of the recommendations that come from this cluster. Our next cluster, which is on people, animal ecosystems, health and well-being. So when looking at people, animal ecosystems and health, health and well-being, we have the one health approach, which, which demands collaboration across the three interdependent sectors. There is the animal health, the health sector and ecosystems to prevent, detect and respond to disease threats. African ministries of health and environment demonstrated an early commitment to One Health when they signed the Libreville Declaration at the first interministerial conference on health and environment in 2008, and subsequently the endorsement of a 10 year strategic action plan from 2019 to 2029 at the third interministerial conference on health and environment in Gabon in 2018. But despite all these commitments uh, by the African Black countries, the initiative Africa. remains with its challenges. As we can see from the slide, the lack of evidence, the absence of matrix and indicators, loss of awareness and the knowledge across Africa and limited inclusion of natural environment. And some of the key recommendations also when we're looking at this, because this is the nexus between animal and ecosystem well-being, which has significant impact on the health and well-being of people. So there's compelling evidence linking the disruptions of the human-animal environment interface with infectious disease outbreaks. Um, some, some of the evidence is that over 75% of emerging infectious diseases have been zoonotic in nature, transmitted from animal hosts to humans. Land use, consumption of wildlife and tourism activities can result in spillover of pathogens between wildlife, uh, livestock and human and all these interfaces. So biodiversity loss can negatively impact food security, immune response, and mental health. Hence, the recommendations actually look into uh, strengthening and improving how we are dealing with this nexus. Next slide. Um, the um, third um, cluster, which is the land restoration and biodiversity. Uh, under this third cluster, land restoration we know that is key in improving biodiversity in farming landscapes and achieving neutrality for and uh, degradation, for land degradation. So to achieve this extension, to achieve all of this, uh, the land restoration and biodiversity, we also need to acknowledge that extension services are at the heart of knowledge, learning and sharing of best practices especially when we're looking to at the um, subsistence farmers and all play key players within the agriculture sector. And the effect can result in high quality production, aiding in resilience and building, uh, aiding in the resilience building during the shocks. 
So it's quite uh, important to uh, take into consideration how we are improving the soil health carbon capture, how we are improving farmers extension knowledge and also improving larger ecosystems. And key policy recommendations uh, under this cluster outcome include promotion of micro gardening. Uh, I know here in Malawi, we are also promoting integration of uh, integrated household farming, which is being promoted and also engaging key stakeholders in designing effective agroforestry systems. So there are numerous ways and this slide sort of presents some of the key recommendations as well. Then our last cluster, if I'm not mistaken, is the land water energy resource use. Africa's land, water, and energy resources are facing increasing pressure due to population growth, economic development, and urbanization. Uh, climate change has aggravated the pressure on these resources. With the marginalization of many African communities, this makes the continent the most vulnerable to climate change impacts. These challenges coupled with misguided government policies together with the chronic gender disparities rooted in Africa's culture call for an urgent mitigation response. And some of the key recommendations again for the last cluster are unlocking partnerships and resources, improving land tenure security, investing in rainwater harvesting and water storage options, strengthening capacity for the collective, um, for the collection and accurate and timely data on water quality, and also empowering women to equal stakeholders, to be equal stakeholders. So making sure that women are involved in the planning, the implementation, and are also involved through the whole cycle if it's implementation of anything related to land, water, energy resource use. Then the general recommendations. Policy design should be based on social systems from the initial program stage up to long-term maintenance and monitoring. So ensuring that stakeholder participation throughout decision-making processes, supporting capacity building and stewardship, and also expanding learning networks for capacity building. Uh, early information for early actions. So here we are looking at these should be done to avoid reaching tipping points and that requires integrated disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation, and resilience in coherent policy documents. Climate proofing should not be a diversion to the real engagement of adaptation in Africa. Another recommendation is the empowering of our local communities, which have confidence and local knowledge to drive their own livelihoods. So avoiding importing imported top-down solutions is those coming from global negotiations. New policies should support local spontaneous ownership for rapid and larger upscaling. Then our final recommendation is trigger agency in leveraging adaptation finance because mitigation prog programs barely address community vulnerabilities. New finance models will support the development of local green jobs, leveraging from the many opportunities in Africa as they will focus on community aspirations and priorities for investments on winning practices. So in conclusion, um, what we are saying is the impact of climate change on food systems pose a substantial threat to efforts made to reduce poverty. So Africa's governance framework at a regional and sub-regional levels are generally sound regarding the necessary expressed and implied provisions for addressing climate change and its impact. And also the One Health approach transcends multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary concepts and expands in scope to cover ignored fields. Next slide on conclusion. We also see that coordinated land and water governance offers possibilities 
of better capitalizing on the mutual reinforcing efficiencies in land and water use. And finally, we also see that combating desertif uh, desertif desertification of uh, and land degradation and mitigation, mitigating the effects of drought will secure long-term socioeconomic benefits for people living in the drylands and reduce their vulnerability to climate change. Thank you all. Thank you tonight for that presentation and for summarizing it so well. I think I have picked quite a number of points uh, that you highlighted during the presentation. So issues around coordination, issues around strengthening capacities, making sure that whilst we get the policies right, we need to make sure that those policies are being implemented. You also spoke about empowering local communities. I think one of the things that was highlighted by the, um, the IPCC Africa chapter was that indigenous knowledge is something that we are not as being key when compared to your sort of scientific knowledge, but definitely there is room and there is space for indigenous knowledge when it comes to uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. So thank you so much for raising those points. At this point, I think we are now going to transition into the regional reflection, um, our different regional representatives on what speaks to them from these four club uh, thematic areas and what is the most urgent challenge for them to be addressed. We are going to start off with Dr. Manye Mutamba, who is the head of Agriculture, Food Systems and Rural Resources Unit at the African Union Development. Thank you, Tendi. I'm not sure if I'm the only one who is losing you there, but... Uh, uh, An agency, Aude Nepad, Mbe Mwale, who is the climate change professor. We are then going to hear from domains and weed improvement. Sorry, I think maybe my network cut out there for a minute. Uh, after Dr. Nyakumbo, we are going to hear from Ms. Beatrice Makwenda. We are going to hear from Ms. Rejoice Mutangi, and we'll end with Dr. Baitz Podis. So I'm not going to interrupt the flow of the speakers. We are going to sort of go in that order, starting with Dr. Uh, Mutamba's reflection. So Dr. Mutamba, over to you. Thank you, Tembi. Uh, sorry, I might have blushed. I, I might have missed some of what you said earlier on there. But uh, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity uh, to interact with uh, colleagues all over in the region, in the continent, and beyond. Uh, just to go straight into you know the discussion and the reflection. For me, uh, I think. All the four thematic areas speak to me. You know, I, I think they are connected. I think they are equally important. And to be honest, I I I know that uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's easy to disaggregate some of these uh, uh, thematic areas. But when you think about it, they are intricately linked. And uh, I think we need to grow our appreciation of how linked these different you know, elements are when you think of climate, when you think of people, when you think of food, when you think of water, land, ecosystems, and the energy systems that drive these, they are all equally, they are all intricately linked. And as we look for solutions, I, I feel and I really think that uh, as you say in one of your, you know, discussions in one of the thematic areas, you know, the more we look at these things from an integrative perspective, you know, the better we become at, uh, at, at actually fashioning and designing solutions, you know, that are sustainable solutions that, are, uh, that don't undermine other elements of, of, of the system. So just to go back to your, you know, to your thematic areas, I would say that, uh, you know, when it comes to the, you know, the, the work on climate change and food systems, 
I know that uh, as a region and as uh, the continent, there's been quite a bit of work that has gone on and uh, we've made progress. But to be honest, I think the challenge is when I look at the pace of climate change, you know, when I look at the impacts on food systems, I believe that, you know, the climate is actually progressing, climate change is progressing faster than we are able to adapt ourselves. It's perhaps moving at a pace and uh, scale that uh, is uh, out, you know, out, uh, you know, overtaking our efforts and in our investments in this, you know, in, in trying to adapt to climate change. So there is no doubt in my mind that we really need to find that next gear if we are to, you know, to keep up with the challenge of climate change. I probably would would need, you know, another focused discussion on uh, on climate change impacts on food systems. To be honest, because you know, the agency, you know, the scale of the problem suggests that we quickly need to get our act together and we, you know, we quickly need to get on top of, you know, you know, addressing, you know, the impacts uh, of climate change. Because, you know, when you look at the work we've done on climate smart agriculture, I still feel that, uh, you know, there's a lot that we need to do if we are to keep up with the, you know, the, the pace you know, of, uh, of this challenge. On land uh, restoration and biodiversity, it's obviously, you know, a thematic area that is, you know, very important that, you know, the decade on ecosystem restoration, you know, has already started. And the challenge when it comes to climate, when it comes to food, when it comes to, you know, restoring ecosystems, the challenge is huge. And, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, what we need you know, to do, like I said, is, is linked to, you know, in many other, in, in the many sort of thematic areas that we are looking at here. You know, you know again, this is a, a thematic area that I believe uh, we might need a more focused discussion. And I, I'm, I'm happy to speak one of these days on the work that we're doing as AUD and APAD on uh, land restoration. I'm sure you know we, 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 we're leading the AFR 100 initiative, the Africa Land, Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative. And our member states, we have 32 member states that have signed up to this initiative, essentially committing themselves to restoring, you know, now we have a commitment of 27 million hectares of, you know, degraded landscape on the continent that our member states have committed to restoring. You know, it's a, it, we are excited about some of the work that we're doing in that regard. And, uh, you know, one, one of, the, you know, the seminars, I think, will have an opportunity to go into a bit more detail about what we're doing there, including some supporting young entrepreneurs who are, you know, you know participating in businesses that are restoring land and uh, ecosystem. I'll be happy to speak about that at some point if you invite me to another seminar. Uh, but today I was uh, going to go a bit more on the land, water, energy, uh, nexus, and, and uh, some of the work that we're doing. I was just going, I'm just going to give an example of the work that we have done and the value that we've uh, found in looking at this integrative approach to, you know, to solving, uh, you know, you know, problems. You know, as you say, these are connected, you know, systems, land, water, the energy that drives these systems, the people, you know, for us, we've also put food on top of, you know, that connection. And we've really looked at, you know, how we can, you know, tackle some of the integrated sort of the connected complex, you know, you know, problems that we face as society you know, particularly the African continent, by looking at these in a connected way. I'll give you an example of the work we've done in Sierra Leone. You know, you know we, 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 were, we were working in a community that is hosting a, a university called Jijala University established in 1911, uh, has never had, you know, electricity. A university hosting 5,000 students with water problems, with power problems, with food issues, you know, and the surrounding community with equally the same spread of, uh, you know, problems. So our solution, you know, included, you know, utilizing a mini grid, you know, solar powered mini grid, you know, to power, you know, the local university, 
you know, to power water supply for the university, for the surrounding community, but also we integrated that with an irrigation solution, utilizing water smart, you know, approaches to really boost food production in the same, you know, community. The, the energy system has worked and has transformed this community so much that, you know, they've gone on to expand it to 150 megawatts of, of power, now powering the university, the, you know, the local clinic, which has now been upgraded to a hospital because of the energy, you know, component that is, you know, even transformed the way, you know, this system works. The irrigation system, I understand now, has been expanded to supply, you know, inputs in the, in the form of seedlings for the local community and food for, you know, you know, for the community through vegetables. I know that now there are plans already to start setting up small enterprises that are taking advantage of the power and taking advantage of the flourishing, you know, production of vegetables to, 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 to boost, you know, local processing, value addition, drying, packaging of vegetable products, you know, already creating, you know, you know, viable economic opportunities for the local community. And just to conclude by saying that, you know, it's a model that we see being taken by the country, you know, into other parts of, you know, the country. So, you know, for me, the strength of this approach was the integrative, you know, solution, you know, you know, approach that we took, you know, and I think it's something that has informed what we're doing in other parts of our, you know, our work. And, uh, you know, when I looked at what you, you know, you know, you're putting on the table, I, you know, it's something that spoke to me, it's something that grabbed my attention. But just to jump to my last uh, intervention, in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, some of the messages that we really need to, you know, to strengthen or to at least to communicate with our member states and to communicate with our leaders, you know, for me, I think, we really need to get better when it comes to the implementation. You know, when it comes to getting our hands dirty on the ground and getting things done, we, we've become very good with crafting nice ideas, but when it comes to implementing them on the ground, I think we're still lagging behind. We need to learn a lot about how to do that better, how to do that at speed, how to do that at scale. We really need to work on that because, you know, the pace at which climate change is advancing, like I said, you know, we really need to catch up and we really need to do better than that. You know, investments in key areas are lagging behind. And I, I know that our member states need to be, you know, told this fact. And if we don't change that, I, I think, you know, we will have a very a difficult future going forward. And just to conclude by saying, when it comes to smallholder agriculture, it's not going to be some magic solution that is going to take us from to where we want to be we cannot ignore the systemic issues that we've identified, you know, that are behind the lack of movement when it comes to conditions for success for viable uh, agriculture for small order, you know, farmers on the continent. We know what we need to do when it comes to, to markets, when it comes to capacity, when it comes to ensuring that we've got quality support, quality advice, quality extension for small order farmers, when it comes to connecting them better with information sources, we know what needs to happen. These are systemic, these are persistent issues. We cannot afford to ignore them. And we cannot afford to think, to keep looking that there could be another magic when another magic solution that will come from, from somewhere. We need to get these basics right and we need to do it like right now. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Manuel, for those reflections and for really uh, stressing the need for implementation. I think we can have all the wonderful ideas and all the best intentions, but unless we put the, our hands in the dirt, like you said, and get onto the ground, there's really no point to all those wonderful uh, strategies, plans, and policies. I think at this point, let me hand over to Luembe, uh, to give us his reflections. I hope everyone is um, is following and that if there are any questions or any sort of points that people want to raise, please use the chat function. Luembe, over to you. 
Uh, thank you so much, Tembi, and uh, thank you so much, uh, the co-conveners of this very important event. I think issues of climate change, as well as land, uh, energy, are very much important if we are to achieve uh, the SDGs, but also the Agenda 2063. Uh, when I looked at the four clusters, I think like Dr. Uh, uh, Manieu mentioned, all of them are important, but I'm going to focus on the cluster that deals with the work that we do as COMESA especially the climate change program. And when I looked at the clusters, I looked at uh, cluster number one on uh, climate change impacts on food systems in Africa. Now, why this cluster for us? Uh, there's more than enough food being produced in the world to feed everyone on the planet. But what are the current statistics? As many as uh, 811 million people go to bed hungry each night, you can imagine. Enough food is produced, but 811 million people each night go to bed hungry. An alarming statistic, not so. Now, smallholder farmers, the headers, fishermen produce about 70% of the global food supply. And yet they're especially vulnerable to food insecurity and uh, poverty and hunger most acute among rural populations. Another statistic, an estimated 14 million children under the age of five worldwide suffer from severe, severe acute malnutrition, also known as severe wasting. Yet only 25% of acutely malnourished children have access to life-saving treatment, you can imagine. Now, current research indicates that climate change will have significant impact on the agriculture and food systems, especially in Africa where levels of poverty and hunger are already high. What does that mean? It means that food production systems need to adapt to climate change. Food policy need to adapt to climate change or take climate change into account. So what is the most urgent challenge that needs to be addressed? In my view, the most urgent challenge is a complete paradigm shift that is required in both agriculture and food systems. In short, the policies that we have, the investments that we have, the innovations that we have currently are not enough and Dr. Manieo mentioned to say, climate change is moving at a faster pace than the policy, the investments and the innovations that we have in place. So agriculture and food system policies need to be informed by latest climate change data. We need to invest more in climate resilient agriculture such as climate smart agriculture and conservation agriculture. We also need to promote integration of indigenous knowledge with conventional scientific knowledge. This is essential to avoid maladaptation. The latest IPCC report shows that in as much as we're trying to adapt to climate change, there's also the issue of maladaptation. We've got the good intentions, but because we are following a top-down approach instead of a bottom-up approach, you find that we have maladaptation now. The other thing is that we need to integrate climate change into entire food system value chains to avoid post-harvest post -harvest losses and food waste. This is essential to ensure, uh, to ensure that the entire food system value chain is climate proofed. Food is being produced quite okay, but the wastes or the losses is also too much. So if we are to achieve uh, uh, food security in the face of climate change, we need to ensure that uh, the whole value chain is uh, climate proofed and we avoid food losses and waste, especially post harvest uh, losses. Private sector has a key role to play in promoting things such as uh, uh, climate smart agriculture, as well as the uh, CA technologies. Capacity building of all actors in the food systems on uh, climate change adaptation is also essential because the food system itself has got several actors. So all those have to be uh, 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 built in terms of the capacity. What are the adaptation options available? What do they need to do to ensure that they play their part in climate proofing the whole uh, uh, food system value chain? What is COMESA doing to address uh, this issue? COMESA in collaboration with the FAO supported member states to develop national agriculture investment plans, which basically are aimed at attracting or increasing government uh, investment in the agriculture sector, but also to attract private sector uh, investment. COMESA has been uh, 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 promoting uptake of climate smart agriculture and conservation agriculture. These two forms of uh, agriculture have proven to increase not only yields, but also improving livelihoods of many rural farmers. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
For instance, Comesa supported the integration of CSA and uh, CA into agricultural colleges, as well as uh, primary schools. This has been a very uh, good strategy because uh, people who are moving out of college are able to now uh, practice uh, CSA as well as CA. The primary schools as children are growing up and doing their uh, schooling, they're able to know how to uh, plant uh, agricultural crops in a climate smart way, but also increase their yields. For instance, in Uganda, we had an issue where uh, parents who are unable to, to sponsor their children were now able to sponsor their children and to increase uh, or to improve their nutrition because their yields had improved because of practicing CSA. COMES has also been documenting CSA best practices and sharing them in the region as a way of promoting CSA to improve food security. COMESA has in place uh, what is known as a regional agriculture investment plan. Now, this regional agriculture investment plan seeks to contribute through better policy coordination, policy implementation, as well as budget support for agriculture, forestry and fisheries, sustainable agriculture production and productivity, food security, and, as well as regional integration. COMESA also provides uh, comprehensive and evidence-based policy findings and improving the policy environment for investment as well as agriculture trades. So what are the key messages for our leaders that they need to hear for them to, to, to improve this sector? Well, the impacts of climate change on food systems pose a great or substantial threat to efforts made to reduce poverty, as already highlighted in the uh, previous uh, presentations. Now, we have the SDGs in place. We have the Paris Agreement in place. We have the Agenda 2063 in place. With climate change in view, these uh, uh, international frameworks become very difficult to achieve. So the key messages to be, can be summed up in seven thematic areas. Number one, we need the robust policies that promote agricultural development. Number two, we need significant financial investments into the agriculture sector. And third, we need to promote agriculture practices that can create regenerative food systems and healthy natural ecosystems. And these include CSA as well as CA, but also many other uh, ecosystem-based uh, uh, solutions or technologies. We need to implement adaptation solutions such as drought-resistant crop varieties or stress-tolerant crops. These are known to reduce or to raise rather productivity and income security of millions of smaller farmers on the African continent. As already mentioned, we need to address post-harvest losses as well as food waste which are tailored to local uh, conditions. And we need to document, especially the best practices in the region and share so that many other uh, smallholder farmers as well as governments can, can take up uh, CSA, uh, CA and many other technologies. We need to promote private sector investment and promote youth participation in agribusiness. The agriculture sector is seen as a dirty uh, uh, occupation, so to speak. With a youth population uh, bouge on the continent, governments have to ensure that the policies, investments, or financial instruments, even institutional arrangements, attract the youth to invest in uh, agriculture as well as in food systems, so that agribusiness can become a source of employment for the youth. So I think in my view, those are my reflections, and uh, over to you, Temi. Thank you. Thank you, Lembe, for those uh, reflections. I, I, I really appreciate you taking time to walk us through what Comesa is doing, but also then giving us what uh, we should be focusing on and what key messages our leaders should be taking to COP. I would like to ask Dr. Nyakumbo right now to come to the um platform and to take us through his presentation i'm very aware that in terms of our time we need to sort of uh, move a bit quick so dr nyakumbo over to you after dr nyakumbo i'll just like to invite miss makwenda and uh, and rejoice and dr podisi to just come one after the other without my intervention so that we do not lose any time in between over to you dr nyakumbo Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, greetings from Arare. My name is Isaiah Nyagumbo. I'm from CIMIT, from the uh, Sustainable Agri Food Systems Program. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank Please you. go ahead. 
Thank you. Uh, my uh, presentation is going to simply reinforce what my other two colleagues have uh, raised in the last uh, 20 minutes. Um, we're talking here about building sustainable and resilient smallholder cropping systems in Southern Africa. Our work as CIMIT uh, mostly uh, focuses on uh, uh, the first theme or first uh, issue or uh, thematic area, which is really about climate change impacts on food systems in Africa, more like uh, what our colleagues from uh, uh, Comesa are talking about. But we also really effectively address many other areas uh, as, a, as an institution. Uh, we are hosted in, um, headquartered in Mexico. Uh, we have offices uh, throughout the world and um, CIMIT really, uh, really transforms research into large scale uh, uh, farm uh, and impacts and, and through uh, strong established partnerships that we have throughout the, 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 the world. But I must say that uh, there is a very diverse uh, set of skills within the institution. Uh, we have people who work on bi biodiversity, food security, uh, climate change, uh, and so on. So really CIMIT is an institution that tries to address most of these themes that you're talking about uh, in a very broad way. And we're trying to transform uh, farm, I mean, our research into large scale farm, farm level impacts through these strong uh, established partnerships. I must say also that CIMIT does not work in on its own. It's a CG center or a consultative group on international agro agricultural research, which is working strongly with uh, partnerships uh, who are spread uh, in each and every country where we work. So we don't just work alone, but we work together with uh, many partners. Our current focus, uh, Madam Chair, is that uh, we work mostly on climate change adaptation, uh, sustainable crop and land management, agroecology and biodiversity, appropriate scale mechanization, nutritious and stress tolerant, maize breeding is also a major focus, pest and disease resistance work, adoption and uh, impact assessment uh, activities. So we have quite a broad range of uh, issues that we address. But I must say, what challenges are we really trying to tackle? Uh, you heard from Dr. Mtamba uh, the issues of degradation. We're looking at climate uh, variability and change. Quite often, we have challenges where we have too much or too little rainfall. Uh, maize monoculture in Zimbabwe, you're looking at more than 60% of the cropped area being put to maize, even in regions where it is not recommended, like in region five, where the rainfall is like 400 millimeters or so per, per year. Clearly insufficient for maize, but farmers still go for maize. We have also issues to do with poor mechanization. Uh, uh, animal traction is taking on about 40% of uh, uh, energy input. And of course, uh, the latest key on the block, poor market incentives, uh, particularly the issue of uh, fertilizer. Right now we're faced with more than 50 US dollars per bag or 50 kg bag of fertilizer right now following the uh, current uh, hikes in price uh, caused by the war in uh, Russia and, and Ukraine. So there is a lot of challenges that we are facing, but some of these challenges have been with us for many years and it's very frustrating. I must say that uh, over these years, we don't seem to be making mileage in addressing these issues. So uh, we have lots of challenges. I must say also our colleagues from uh, uh, the breeding uh, sectors in CIMIT uh, show us that uh, in terms of yield uh, under drought conditions, we tend to have uh, a very steep fall in yields uh, as uh, temperatures increase. Uh, whereas under optimal management, things tend to be much better. If you see, uh, you had also Dr. Mtamba and uh, Dr. Male also talking about climate change. We're looking at every decade uh, since 1950s, every decade has kind of seen a very huge leap in the average temperature uh, uh, of, of, of the land. And so you find that in this case, we talking about the need for new varieties that cope with these new increases in temperature. In other words, the environment that we faced in the 70s is very, very different from what we face in the 80s, what we face in the 90s, what we face uh, uh, currently. So there is really need to look at uh, how we can address some of these things. Uh, again, in terms of temperature, uh, we're looking at a 2.1% percent, uh, 2.1 degree increase in uh, temperature by 2050. And uh, our 
simulators uh, or modelers tell us that uh, this will reduce maize yields by 11% in many countries of uh, uh, Southern Africa. So these are very serious issues. Uh, a reduction of 11% in maize yield is serious news for us. So what is CIMIT doing? I must say we are effectively looking at sustainable intensification uh, of systems trying to move away from the conventional tillage systems, plow-based systems, raging systems, which are just uh, discharging of, uh, a lot of rain and runoff out of their systems, which in, in, in turn causes lots of runoff, uh, siltation of dams and so on. And we're trying now to move towards conservation agriculture, which has been referred to by the two previous speakers. So many options of doing conservation agriculture, a lot of people just think it's a, 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 the basin system that is a, a known to require a lot of uh, uh, labor, but no, there is many options, particularly systems that diversify from just the maize-based uh, systems. So what are the highlights of some of the achievements from the work in Southern Africa by CIMIT? I would say that uh, we have uh, drought tolerant maize that, it, that can increase yield by 20% uh, from the work that has been done. Uh, about 44% of the maize area in Zimbabwe, for, for example, is uh, planted to improved varieties which have uh, CIMIT genetics. Over a million people have benefited from some of these improved genetics. And uh, we find that an independent study uh, has suggested that the uh, tolerant hybrids, they tend to yield 15% more under stress conditions. And we're looking at uh, some gain or genetic gain, uh, as the breeders put it, uh, of about 2.13% uh, per year. So there's a lot of progress being made with respect to maize varieties, but not only uh, just maize varieties, there's also a, a lot of emphasis on uh, uh, the pro-vitamin A varieties. And so 12 maize varieties, uh, hybrids have been commercialized in Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Tanzania. And uh, we're looking at uh, more than 2,568 tons that have been produced, which is enough uh, for uh, more than 100,000 hectares or some 58,000 households. So a lot of work uh, that is being done. By the way, it is being done together with the private sector. CIMIT is not doing all this uh, alone. But I think also one thing that we tend to also notice is that uh, the droughts uh, that we often face can also drop the uh, content of uh, the pro-vitamin A of uh, some of these varieties. For instance, if you have uh, a, non a variety producing or giving something like 15 uh, micrograms per gram of uh, pro-vitamin A, if you have a drought, then this can drop to five, five micrograms. So very serious drop and uh, that can be a big problem. So droughts and these extremes can be uh, uh, very huge problems. But also when we're using these uh, technologies, also, combining it with good agronomic practices is very important. For instance, if you have maize grown as monoculture, you have the iron content being very low, uh, as in the graphs that you see on the left. So, but if you follow this maize, or if maize is grown after uh, cow pea, after, after pigeon pea, um, after dolichos lab lab, and these other legumes, you find that the iron content is a lot higher. Similarly, if you use uh, Inorganic fertilizers without organics, uh, again, you tend to find that uh, things can be very, very, very bad in terms of uh, the iron content. So Madam Chair, I think the, also the point that we need to uh, then look at is when we have these varieties, how do then should farmers grow them? We are looking here uh, as an example of the Pumbuza system, which is really a manual whole CA, which, is implemented, which was implemented by 2.2 million smallholder farmers in 2020-21. And on average, uh, Zimbabwe actually managed to yield uh, something like 5.28 tons per hectare compared to 1.16 tons per hectare from unimproved uh, practices. So this is really uh, a huge jump in terms of productivity uh, from these uh, farms. And uh, I think for me, the important story there is, 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 is the policy impacts. Here we have a situation where government together with the, 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 the private sector and other key players joined hands and supported farmers to work on this. And uh, that really uh, produced some serious uh, 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 results. So policy can have some very serious effects uh, and uh, support to the technologies if, we, uh, if we, everything's done correctly. 
But apart from that, we have uh, the work which we have done in the region, which shows that uh, across the whole of the Eastern and Southern African environments and relative to the conventional tillage with a mean of uh, 2,400 kgs per hectare from some conservation agriculture rotations had the highest maize yield increase for about 35% compared with the, these intercrops where we had maybe only 15%. So the point here is that the rotations in CA systems can really have some serious effects and the over uh, five countries were involved here in a, more than seven countries in a project that we call Senesa. So very interesting results. And so far also we have 53 mechanization service providers which have been provided in Zimbabwe and Zambia who have been providing mechanical, uh, mechanized planting, shelling, threshing, and transportation uh, services to hundreds of smallholder farmers. Again, we were talking about youths. I think this is where the youth can come in. I think the idea of in ensuring that we incentivize youth into the systems is very key. We also have a situation where uh, we are told that the farming uh, community is actually now faced with aging farmers. And so how do we bring back youth? How do we incentivize youth to come back? So unless it becomes attractive enough for the youth to be part of it, then we have a challenge. Again, serious issues showing that in dry years, we have, uh, um, in dry years, we have a situation where uh, CA doesn't, I mean, give you much higher results in terms of benefits, 64% or 70% compared to wet years. And I'll try to uh, move faster. Again, here is a, a graph which also shows you that uh, the relative benefits in an environment which is less than 700 millimeters uh, in East and Southern Africa, this is Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, and uh, Mozambique, you find when rainfall is below 700 millimeters, we have very huge benefits from conservation agriculture systems. And uh, that is really a, a huge, oh, am I stopped? Yes, please uh, just uh, conclude. I see you have two more slides, if you can just go through them quickly. Yes, uh, thank you. So, um, thank you. So, um, Madam Chair, just to, to finish it up, I'm, all I'm saying here is that we need to, what is our policy thrust for adapting to a changing climate and this increased variability? We're really talking here about the need to intensify and diversify, maybe using digital technologies, which also enable us to reach more farmers, using uh, mechanized systems, and uh, also ensuring that farmers are using appropriate uh, uh, germplasm, which enables them to uh, achieve much better results. Am I stopped from there? Uh, I'm not sure. Are you, you're not controlling your slides because there's now a, a help box that has come on to the no, slide. I'm not controlling anything from this side anymore. Sylvester, can you please help with removing that so that you can conclude? Okay. Thank you. But anyway, ma Madam Chair, I would say the just to finish off, I was just saying the, the need to combine and diversify uh, farmers from the maize based systems which have uh, tended to. Uh, result in monoculture and uh, poor productivity is really key. We need to put a lot of emphasis on that. I also want to reinforce on what my other colleagues said uh, that uh, the youths need to be involved uh, and we need to attract them back into agriculture. And how do we do that? We need to make agriculture viable and attractive. And I think these are very serious issues that need to be undertaken or considered. Also, I think the clear message for me also is that policy uh, engaging policy will need to go beyond just the, doing the policy brief. Beyond the policy briefs, we need to really follow it with some tangible action and get ourselves dirty and uh, get uh, real action on the ground, which can be used to then convince the policy makers. I think uh, that's all I could say, Madam Chair. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. My apologies. No, thank you so much, Dr. Nyakumbo. Uh, and apologies for the, I think we have been hijacked here on the screen. Sylvester, if you can just stop uh, whoever is, thank you. Um, and we can just proceed. Thank you, Dr. Nyakumbo. Your presentation was well received. The work that Summit is doing was also well noted and also the key messages 
that you highlighted for our um, our policymakers what to be able to. What the fuck was that, Isaiah? Okay, I, Sylvester, please help us with uh, making sure that we don't have any rogue agents in our meeting. Uh, I think somebody is trying to hack our meeting. I hope we can just proceed um, without any more disturbances. We will now move on now to Ms. Beatrice Makwenda from Trust Africa for her interventions. Beatrice, over to you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Tammy, and thank you all. Um, good. It's, a, it's afternoon now. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think for, for us, first of all, Trust Africa is, um, is a Pan-African uh, foundation, uh, mainly uh, focusing on strengthening capacities, harnessing agency, but also um, uh, promoting uh, responsible governance and equitable development across, uh, mainly uh, also uh, looking at African philanthropy, especially when we look at uh, investing in agriculture and in this specific case, uh, investing in climate uh, solutions that are long lasting. Uh, to just pick on the key themes that we've uh, talked about, like I think my predecessors have said, uh, they are really uh, interconnected and it's a bit uh, difficult to choose which particular theme speaks to uh, speak to us. But I would like maybe to take more on, on the, uh, the land, water and energy use uh, uh, theme, uh, mainly because of uh, um, uh, the challenges that we see on the continent as it re re relates to uh, resource governance. And I think this is where we have um, uh, some a lot of challenges that we need to uh, to focus on in terms of uh, putting in place regulations, uh, but also uh, creating a well-informed citizenry and uh, public sector, but also private sector that is responsible. Um, uh, we look at uh, how water resources, uh, issues of contamination, how uh, mining, for example, um, um, uh, also has an impact to what extent we can uh, generate and um, uh, promote uh, um, uh, climate change solutions, as we have noted. Uh, one key issue that we would want to, uh, to, to, to talk about and uh, uh, towards what uh, Trust Africa really does is really looking and zeroing in on the, are we able to, uh, to support? There's a whole lot of uh, different interventions and we all look to a uh, public investment uh, towards these. Uh, we've done a lot of pilots uh, and I think a lot of uh, some of our uh, um, research that has gone on into the, on, to the continent that has come up with some of uh, um, innovations uh, either to do with climate, uh, climate smart agriculture, either to even promote agroecology in its entirety. But you find that uh, I think it's either just pilots or uh, they lack scalability and mainly it's to do with investment. And we always ask ourselves whether we uh, do we have enough resources on the continent to push through our own uh, homegrown solutions uh, or things that we indeed have determined in the national determination contributions that we have or indeed in the national agriculture investment plans that we have uh, and in many cases we find either our budgets are um, uh, are not balanced, uh, or maybe we have increased debt and borrowing uh, to, to support some of the uh, um, uh, sectors across the board. But you find at the same time, we have a lot of illicit financial flows that are going out. Uh, I think Trust Africa recent work estimates that about 89 billion US dollars that really cannot, uh, uh, is gone through uh, due to either uh, uh, lack of uh, governance in, uh, in our natural resources or um, in other economic activities that are happening on the continent that would really help us to reinvest in the sector, but also to reinvest in, the, uh, in some of the solutions um, uh, that we have uh, even had today. So those are, I would say if it's a message uh, that we we'll need to go is to, to go back to the drawing board and put systems in place and regulations that really keep these illicit uh, financial uh, flows uh, that we see on the continent so that we can uh, begin to, to say it's our homegrown solutions. We begin to, um, to, to take charge of the research and development and really research on the areas uh, that as a continent we would want to, uh, to generate solutions on and then uh, scale them up within our communities. The other aspect, it goes to institutions. And I think this is also work that Trust Africa is doing in terms of empowering institutions, especially uh, smallholder uh, farming communities in terms of them um, 
uh, getting them to participate, uh, both in terms of decision making in policy uh, and program formulations, but also for them because eventually um, uh, we say that where the uh, the tar meets the rubber is um, is, is where is where we is, is where things should happen at uh, 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 in the in the in the local communities so if we strengthen for example farm associations uh, then we know that they will be able to to deliberate they will be able to track but also then you can create um uh, uh, you can create scale and impact at that level um and we look at uh, in many cases our solutions we have to attach to a business case on it and mostly uh, we are looking at does it make business sense to our solutions? solutions make business sense. And uh, for part of Trust Africa's work is needed to look at value distribution, even in the climate, uh, climate mitigation and adaptation solutions and interventions that are there. And this is where we also have to focus on the role of private sector um, uh, in, 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 the, in, in this whole